Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to class. Uh, today we are going to talk about a very important phenomenon in social linguistics called speech community. Though this term is self-explanatory, but we'll do a quick survey of development of the notion of this term, speech community, and uh, today after much debate, what we understand by this. Now, as, as we have been discussing in social linguistics, uh, language is a very vigorous marker of our identity. It encodes our cultural history, shared narratives, our plights, and common history. And language is very instrumental in encoding and preserving all such things. Now, the idea called speech community also has its basis in this understanding of a shared history, a shared uh, you know, norm, a shared practice, a shared understanding. Speech communities are groups that share values and attitudes about language use, varieties, and practices. The, these communities develop through prolonged interaction among those who operate within these shared and recognized beliefs and value system regarding forms and styles of communication. So, so this is this is built or created, constituted on the basis of shared language, shared understanding, shared values, shared attitude, so everything which is shared and common. Uh, because you know, while we are born with an in, uh, innate ability to ability to capacity to acquire any language, we do so in a cultural or societal framework, right? But today, uh, the revolution of te in technology, globalization process, migration, movement, and uh, you know, boom in IT technology, digitization process, this whole f idea of community has changed. So we are into uh, a virtual world, and we have no idea where this real world ends and the virtual world begins. It's, a, it's such a fine blend. And, uh, you know, so this is, this is very important that in such a scenario and context, we re-look at or we re-evaluate our understanding of community and uh, particularly speech community. So today we are going to do a quick survey of... Uh, uh, you know, understanding, continued and sustained debate, and today what we understand by these terms uh, in social linguistics and particularly the speech community, that what we are going to focus on in this lecture. Now, if you go by the old and one of the most articulated definitions or, uh, you know, formulations of a speech community, we come across the idea by Leonard Bloomfield. So, Leonard Bloomfield explains a group of people who use the same set of speech signals is a speech community. It's a very simple definition which primarily rests on the idea of one language, one community. So it particularly focuses on 
the idea of monolingualism with an assumption that all members of a society speak the same variety, same language. And uh, this is what is understood as speech community. Uh, and it was severely criticized later on and altered. But this is the starting point. So we take it as a starting point, as a starting point for our discussion where Bloomfield emphasizes on one language and one community. But the question is that can be accepted? If you go by this, then we can see there are many communities and very large population which speaks, for example, English as a language and they are all apart miles away from each other. They never, they, they, they are, there is no geographical uh, contiguity, the con they are not in contact and can we say that English forms a single speech community because people use the same language. So this, 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 this definition runs into problem. But this is our starting point of the debate and discussion. But the Bloomfieldian idea was questioned and uh, put to severe criticism by Chomsky in the sense that Chomsky altered the entire understanding of uh, language as social reality. And he talks about internalized language. So he talks about innateness, properties of language. He talks about the human capacity to acquire and use language. He talks about uh, you know, the role of, uh, you know, primary linguistic data in acquisition of language to be so limited, right? So, he redefines the scope of linguistics as being concerned primarily with an ideal speaker-listener. So, he's talking about a homogeneous setup or a group where all the speakers of the language share the same competence as far as linguistic competence is concerned. So this another, this is, this is, uh, you know, a, a challenge to sustain with this Bloomfieldian idea, with this perspective. And uh, he says that, you know, the scope of linguistics has been concerned primarily with an ideal speaker listener in a completely homogeneous speech community who knows its language perfectly and unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions as memory limitations, distractions, shifts of attention and interest and errors in applying his knowledge of the language in actual performance. So he is primarily referring to competence, acquisition, and uh, linguistic competence where he imagines a homogeneous speaker-listener group or he imagine, imagines a homogeneous speech community where the underlying rules of the language are known to all the speakers of the language. And he is not emphasizing on the real use of it. We call it performance. right? So th this is how he restricts the language in that sense being a social reality as uh, advocated by other social linguists and people like Bloomfield. Then we see a very, very important intervention by Delhams in this, in this debate. And uh, Delhams described this speech community as a fundamental concept for the relation between language, speech and social structure. So he is referring to competence which is communicative, communicative competence where the, lang the, the, the user of the language understands social and cultural appropriateness. Right? So he considers the question of boundaries essential in order to recognize that communities are not by definition fixed units. So he's taking into account the heterogeneity of the society, of the setup or the context in which language is being used. 
So he's talking about the heterogeneity in performance, right? Communicative competence, what he calls. So in fact, Delheim's model of ethnographies of communication and his speaking argued for the importance of communicative competence, the knowledge a speaker must have to function as a member of a social group. So, Heim's argument that competence was interrelationship of language with the other code of communicative conduct replaced the notion that language constitutes a speech community with the recognition that a speech community also requires a code of beliefs and behaviors about language and discourse and knowledge of how to use them. That means he is taking into account the appropriateness, social appropriateness, cultural appropriateness. So the knowledge of the structures in terms of how they are to be used in appropriately in a particular social context, in a particular cultural context. And this appropriateness, knowledge of appropriateness of use, you know, constitutes a, a a social shared social norm and people uh, and, and you know allows people to be member of it by abiding by such norms by following such norms so bloomfieldian idea of one language one community gets redefined with uh, delheim's interjection into this debate then a very important signif and significant uh, you know contribution is made by John Gumpage, an anthropologist and uh, uh, social linguist. And uh, Gumpage, you know, uh, revives the debate on speech community by making it more democratic, accommodating and flexible. So, I quote, Gumpage, he says, any human aggregate characterized by regular and frequent interaction by means of a shared body of verbal signs and set off from similar aggregates by significant differences in language usages. He is not talking about one language. He is not talking about homogeneity. So, he is incorporating heterogeneity and he is talking about the total human aggregate of the vowel signals. That means the, the communicative aspect of it, right? When, and he talks about, uh, you know, set of linguistic forms which are shared by all the members of the group. And also, uh, it corresponds to the shared accepted social norms, right? So, regardless of uh, linguistic differences among them, the speech varieties employed within a speech community form a system because they are related to a shared set of social norms. So, she incorporates the uh, you know, heterogeneity in varieties. So, he is not insisting on same variety and one language. We need to keep in mind. Then, Lebov incorporated Chomskyan idea of homogeneity in terms of listener and speaker in a you know, event of communication and Gumper's idea of heterogeneity. So, Lebao very, very uh, beautifully balances both the perspectives, Gumper's perspective and Chomskyan perspective. And the perspective put forward by William Lebov can be seen as a hybrid of Chomsky's structural homogeneity and Gumper's focus on shared norms informing variable practices. So, I quote Lebov what he says, The speech community is not defined by any marked agreement in the use of language elements, so much as by participation in a set of shared norms, these norms may be observed in over types of evaluative behavior and by informally of abstract patterns of variation which are invariant in respect to 
particular levels of use. So you can see very subtle, in a very subtle way, he's all talking about, uh, you know, John Gumper's perspective in the first part of the statement and the second part of the statement where he says that, uh, you know, the norms may be observed in over types of evaluative behavior and by uniformity of abstract patterns. He's talking about that uniformity hinted at by Chomsky. At the same time, he's also talking about, uh, you know, uh, Gumper's heterogeneity and differences in quotes. However, uniformity of uh, maintaining the social norms in practicing language. So, Lebov beautifully combines both these ideas. It also suited him in case because he was doing research uh, in New York City, a very uh, metropolitan uh, setup with uh, a multilingual setup he was doing. And uh, you know that suited his purpose. The, the very famous fourth floor, floor survey in New York City, or maybe his studies in Martha Vineyard Island. So this perspective suited him, and he beautifully combines Chomsky's perspective with John Gumber's, Gumper's perspective, and he this is how he defines uh, you know a speech community. So many scholars and researchers have tried to contribute in this debate and so far what we deduct out of it and how do we understand the speech community, we can summarize that in the following terms. Uh, it is seen as a fluid community of practice. So now a speech community is not seen as language specific where boundaries are limited, linguistic boundaries are limited, but we are talking about shared norms of understanding of the language, shared norms of social practices, right? So, it is seen as a, a fluid community of practice. So, we do not have a different, definite geographical uh, an area to define a speech community. At the same time, we do not have a language specific perspective to define a speech community. So, how do we see that? So, Speech communities may be delocalized and unbounded rather than local, and they often comprise different sub communities with differing speech norms. So, you may find uh, little varieties and variations in, in, the, in the usage of language, but there are certain common, uh, you know, uh, commonly negotiated, accepted norms of use which forms a strong bond. Right? With the recognition of the fact that the speakers actively use language to construct and manipulate social identities by signaling membership in particular speech communities, we no longer consider a speech community with homogeneous speech norms. So, we are accommodating these variations, language variations, and we are no more considering a speech community as just one language, one community thing which has a particular limited boundary, geographical boundary. We are accommodating and that's why it is called a fluid community of practice where we have variations. But important point is that the norms of use, appropriateness, social appropriateness, cultural appropriateness, norms of use, they are all shared and agreed upon. So all the members of that particular defined in a designated speech community will share the same norms of use. The styles, uh, sorry, the varieties may vary, but norms are shared and, you know, negotiated in order to remain in the group. So, that is what constitutes the speech community. So, as a result of continued debate on the notion of a speech community in social linguistics, we understand that Speech community includes not only language and language boundaries, but also the values, attitudes, and ideologies about language. Right? Uh, you can find, uh, you know, this case study by Lebov, Martha Vineyard Island. That's a wonderful example of speech community. 
Thus, while the concept of the speech community initially focused on language systems, relationships and boundaries, it expanded to include now the notion of social representation and norms in forms of attitudes, values, beliefs and practices. So, on the basis of this shared understanding, we understand or constitute a speech community, right? Where we have common attitudes towards the language, common values assigned towards the language, we have common beliefs and practices the way we practice uh, in our everyday transactions, right? This is what makes a speech community fluid and vibrant. So now we understand the speech community as a fluid community of practice. So it is no more language centric and uh, it is no more delimited in terms of language boundaries that we have to keep in mind. The speech community comes to share a specific set of norms for language use through living and interacting together. Variations are allowed, their variations are possible and it becomes visible in multilingual societies where we have more than one languages. But there are certain norms shared and practiced, so there are certain cultural norms, certain social norms, particularly keeping language at the center, they are negotiated and practiced together. So they constitute one speech community. A speech community may therefore emerge among all groups that interact frequently and share certain norms and ideologies. Speech communities may share both particular sets of vocabulary and grammatical conventions as well as speech styles and genre and also norms for how and when to speak in a particular way. So it's more of uh, the use of these linguistic codes in a common shared negotiated pattern. This is what becomes the basis of a speech community. So I hope uh, you know now we can understand and things are clear to you. We will continue our debate uh, again and uh, this is it for now on speech community that uh, it is no more a language centric uh, concept which, which goes by the language boundaries but it is more of a shared understanding of language, notions, uh, shared norms, you know, practices. So it is more fluid and democratic and flexible today and uh, it is all about the values, attitude and linguistic practices that we share together to form a speech community, right? So thank you for now. Thank you very much.